All right. So what we are going to start talking about on today, we're going to look at forensic biology. You should have your paper in front of you so that we can go through this and move on to our next task so that we can be forensic biologists and understand a little bit more of what's going on. So with the virtual lab that you did, you went from DNA extraction to what? Are you guys out there? So went from DNA extraction to what? Um, Say it louder, Simon. What's that stand for? Um, is it PCR? I it was called PCR. PCR. PRC. And what does it stand for? Poly chain reaction. Poly what? Poly it should be PCR, yes, not PRT, PCR. Poly, how do you say it? Polymerase. Polymerase. You've heard it several times, and it should be PCR. I apologize. Um, polymerase chain reaction. What was polymerase? Because not from this. We talked about this when we talked about DNA replication. It was RNA polymerase. What was that? What was that responsible for doing? Okay, let me back up. Going to our macromolecules, it ends in ASE. What is it? Uh, uh, uh. It's an enzyme. So it's going to be responsible for doing what? Speeding up a reaction, correct? What reaction could it possibly be speeding up during DNA replication? The process of what? But what's that portion that first has to start in order for DNA to replicate? Transcription, which is the what? But what does DNA have to first do before it can be copied? That's the break. So RNA polymerase is responsible for breaking. breaking. You might want to jot that down on the side somewhere because that popped up. And we did take notes on that. I will put it where we put PCR and on the side so that you remember we talked about this polymerase before. And RNA polymerase is responsible for breaking that. What is it responsible for, Jenny? Uh, Not breaking down. Well, Good. Splitting. All right. So you went through. Your DNA extraction to, what, what did we go to the second thing again? Yeah, second thing again? Oh. What is it called? Uh, polymerase. polymerase chain reaction. Then we went to? Yeah, Phoresis. Like okay, so with that being said, let's go back to this portion right here. Give me three reasons scientists uh, need to extract or would like to extract DNA. But sorry, give me one. Genetic testing. Give me another one, Brandon. Analysis, Analysis, Analysis of forensic evidence. What types of things would be forensic evidence? Think about yesterday, our case we went through yesterday. Blood, hair, saliva, bodily fluids. What's the third reason why scientists would like to extract some DNA? Uh, Studying genes does not just involving cancer, but involving diseases, period. So we want to, they study DNA so that um, they can be able to see, is there some type of DNA makeup that causes this type of cancer so that we can find a cure for it? All right. So in order to, cure, to get pure DNA, what are some obstacles that need to be dealt with during the extraction process, Jenny? Oh, one of them is the you have to collect cells from the actual test subject. Anything else? What? What? So, what's an obstacle? What? What? What does the, what does the word obstacle mean? It's a challenge. So, what? So, the question is asking. In order to put, some of you need to put that next to the obstacle because you didn't answer that correctly. So, next to the word obstacle, you need to put challenge. So in order to get pure DNA, what are some challenges that need to be dealt with during the extraction process? Not 
prior to that, once you are starting to get that DNA out, what are some challenges you can come across? You got to get the other stuff out because when you extract the cells, like Jenny said, you do have to pull cells from somewhere or get the help from somewhere. Those, your Yesterday, what are some of the samples we had? We had, what, what are some of the samples we had out there? Blood. Blood. Well, that wasn't the, the, the actual sample. What came from that? Oh, bodily fluid. And what was another piece of something we had? Very simple. When we test that, we are going to extract the DNA. However, within that... Within that actual sample, or within those cells, is cells, are cells just made up of DNA? No, there's what? Other stuff in there. All we're trying to get is... Down to the wait. First of all, like, are you here? Where are you right now? Because you're not here, and I need you here. This is the only place you can be right now. So I need you here. I'm here with you. You need to be here with me. If you're tired, you need to get up. So am I. I'm up to two, three o'clock in the morning making sure I prepare for you guys have it. So I need y'all to be with me. And take that. Share what's funny. Because we always like to laugh. It's like now we're all dead. Can we get an agreement that we're here? Because once we get through this, we actually can do some DNA extraction. But first, we need to get through understanding this. Because this will show up on your exam. Whatever issues you got going on with whomever in this room, with me, the class, I need it to go out the window right now because you need to be here. So again, when we're getting down to the nitty gritty of the cell, we are only wanting to pull out what? The DNA. So that means we have to get rid of other stuff, like protein. We gotta break it up, so we gotta get down to the protein. So one of the obstacles, like Rita told us, was to get rid of the other stuff, like protein. So, not gonna go through every last six single piece of this, but what's one way we could obtain DNA from a human? Vernon. Do you need to look at your paper to answer this question? What's one that you can get DNA from a human? We did it yesterday in our lab, our, our demonstration. You saw it on the video. Swabbing what? The swabbing inside the cheek. We can also do what? What can we also do? No, you're not listening to the question. How can we get DNA from a person? We have to go back to the original substance in life. We can get hair follicles. We can get blood. We can get fingerprints, all of those types of things. We can get down to DNA. And fingerprints are something different. We wouldn't get DNA from actual fingerprints because no one has the same fingerprint. That's something different. But we have to get bodily substances to get the DNA because DNA is located in the what? In the cell. So we have to get things that are cells. <laughs> All right, so when we went through all of this uh, information here, what does the word lysis mean, Erin? Oh, come on, I specifically told you this yesterday. Jalil knew it, and you said, no, he was wrong. And I said, he's what? Jalil, what's lysis? Jalil knew yesterday. Huh? It means to separate or to cut or to break. Wait, put that underneath that name. Lysis. It means to break. Separate. So if something was a cell like solution, what would it be? A solution that does what? If it was a cell like solution, it would be a solution that does what? Breaks open the cell. So lysis solution is a, a lysis means to break. So this is going to be a solution that's going to what? Break open something. In this case, it's going to do what? Break open the cell. The salt solution and centrifugation, which we, would be what? What did you learn from that? The salt causes um, protein and other things. 
to come. Because remember, we have not to run the obstacle, we have to get rid of the other stuff because we just want to get to the DNA. The isopropyl alcohol is for what? Makes the, DNA Makes the DNA visible to the eye. Very good, sure. That stuff is going to be good information. So that's the extraction process. Moving on to the PCR. Polymerase. What are they polymerase responsible for again? Good. So once we extract it, because this is what you did when you were, well, with Greg, you were Greg yesterday, right? Greg took the follicles, took the blood, took the bodily fluid, took the lab. He went through this whole process that you all seen on yesterday. He went through the extracting, he pulled the DNA out, then he had to go to the polymerase chain reaction, which went ahead and split the DNA so that, let me back that up, because when we talk about DNA replication and transcription and translation, why do you think he has to use a polymerase? And only what a polymerase is for. Aaron. Not to speed it up, what is a polymerase used for? For splitting the DNA. Why do you think you're going to do that? Okay. Not to somebody else's, to who? The suspect. So, what happens is, you have your bases that link together. DNA is not matched to a complete, you got your sugar, phosphate, and your base. Sugar, your phosphate, and your base. Sugar, phosphate, base. Sugar, phosphate, base. DNA is not matched to a complete strand of DNA. You know, you have your double helix. When we're matching the DNA, we're not matching it to its exact strand that's already complete. Don't pay attention over there. Pay attention here. So, therefore, we have to do what? We have to break it. So once we break it, now we only end up with the half a strand. That's what the polymerase is for. To split it up so we end up with the half a strand. So now we can run it through and then get the actual match for what it is. Does that make sense? So this is what this is doing, the polymerase, the PCR um, reaction. What's the primers for in your, notes, in your lab? Let's figure out the primers were for. Um, okay, so it gets it ready so that it holds on. Ladies, when you go to the nail salon and you get your nails done, do they put the nail polish on first? No. No, they put a lot of a base or what's also called a primer. They put that on so that the nail polish will stay so that you don't leave out there and you come back there and say, my nails yeah. again. All right. DNA polymerase. What was the, pro the function of that procedure? What happened there, Kylie? It replicates DNA at very high temperature. So it's going to go through that process of replicating it. It's not the RNA uh, polymerase, it's DNA. And then nucleotides. First of all, let's back up. What is a nucleotide? It's a building block, but what is it? Just base, sugar, phosphate, and base. What are the two substances that fall under the category of nucleotides? What substance? DNA and RNA. You want to write that down under nucleotides? We have to continuously keep backtracking to remember everything, to go back and to remember so that it links together. So in the final end, you have all of your information. So your nucleotides are RNA and DNA because they both uh, contain what? Sugar, phosphate, and base. Like right? that is your block. We're not going to go through the questions underneath here because that's really already answered within our box and it was answered within your lab procedure, but I do want to go through the jail electrophoresis in somewhat so that we can get to our procedures once they're fully trained to be CSI detectives. Who's calling me? I would like to see this instead of hearing my name. All right. So. 
So imagine that you can use this technique to separate the longer DNA fragments from a target fragment obtained during the PCR procedure. That means you went to the crime scene, you got some information, some bodily fluids, some hair samples, you took it to the lab, you did the DNA extraction, you took, took, went through the PCR procedure. Now you have to put it in here so that you can get the actual footprint of the DNA so that you can match it with your suspect. So you're not done yet. So this is what this is saying. Imagine you already did all of that. How is the gel electrophoresis useful to genetics? Basically, what that's asking you is what? What is that question asking you? Put it in your in, in other words. How else can we ask this question? Speak up. I mean, I think it's wrong. No, but we, but what we need to understand in our mind is every question is not going to be asked the same way. So if you see it another way, you need to be able to understand what it's asking you. So how can we ask this question in another way? Or what is this question asking you? What's the purpose? What's the purpose of gel electrophoresis? So what is the purpose? What is the purpose, Antasia? Speak up. To separate proteins based on size? Are we separating the proteins? What are we separating? We're separating the DNA strands based on size. Make sure you put that there. So gel electrophoresis is useful to genetics because it separates the DNA strands. Genetics are your genes. Your genes are located in your DNA. See how it's important to understand what the question is asking so that you answer it correctly? Because if you said protein, that has nothing to do with our genetics directly. Our DNA does. So when you see that term about gel electrophoresis, it's all talking about genetics. So I'm talking about the DNA, so separating your DNA by size. What is the nature of the gel like? Meaning, what's that question asking? The texture. What is the gel made of? What is the texture of it? So what is it like? Keelan. It's like a sponge-like stuff. Jello-like sponge. Why is running DNA strand important? Why is running the DNA strand important? So what, what is this question asking us? Let's move back for a second. Running the DNA strand, what process is that? Huh? Oh. What is the process running the DNA strand? Gel electrophoresis. Why are you guys overthinking this? So what is the question asking me? Why is Gel electrophoresis important. So why is it important? Um, Roddy. Say it again. It gives you an estimated length of the DNA strands to create a. What's our whole purpose of doing this? We want to end up with a what? Which is called a what? Nope. We talked about it. We initially started with the phrase yesterday because what do we use to be able to match it with somebody else? We call it a what? DNA what? Not called a DNA strand. It starts with an F. Uh, uh, F. So therefore, why is gel electrophoresis important to create a? Say it louder. Why are you guys be afraid to speak up? Is it to create a DNA fingerprint? This is the whole purpose. What is the DNA fingerprint again? What is the DNA fingerprint? What is your fingerprint? This is not DNA. 
Like is this, what is this, is this the same or is it a, it's a replication, it's a, a copy of my fingerprint. So DNA fingerprint is a copy, not of your fingerprint, a copy of DNA. Put that underneath where you put why is DNA strand important to create a DNA fingerprint, which is a copy of DNA. Please keep in mind, the word fingerprint does not mean what I just did. That is not what it's called. The word fingerprint means the copying. Yes, when you go to the crime scene, they do dust for fingerprints because everybody's fingerprints look their own. My fingerprint doesn't match anybody's in here. We all have a very intricate pattern, so we can match it. But we only can match the fingerprints of, us, of the fingerprints that are there if it's already in the system. So if you never, like my fingerprints would be in the system because I'm a teacher, so I have to get my fingerprints ran so that I can be able to teach when I'm not a criminal. But if someone has, does not in a governmental job or anything like that, and they've never committed a crime, but their fingerprints are somewhere and they run them through, they'll have just a random fingerprint. But the moment their fingerprints get entered to the system, if they're going for a job or something like that, they'll be able to pull that fingerprint and say, oh, it matches with this person. But that's not DNA, because notice, when I did this, did I extract any type of bodily fluids or insist substances from my body? No, I just took a copy of it. All right, so we're moving on. Okay. Huh? Yeah. All right, so just moving on here. So when we apply current that allows everything to circulate through, that's four and five, six, we must be, we, what must be applied to the gel so that one can actually visualize the DNA bands? What do they have to add to the gel so we can actually see it? Madison. So this must be a what? Look at the ending. Sugar. This is a sugar made with agar. And this is also what they, they use agar to make ice cream, to help it to jellify or, or that clumpiness together so that it's not just water. So yes, this is what they put there to make it visible. Any questions so far? So we understand this process. All right, because we're going to go through this process and we'll be back up for one moment. So how is the each technique you learn about needed in forensic DNA fingerprinting? How is this needed? Think about yesterday when you had to solve that case. How is this needed? Did you have this one in, put it here, went to people and said, yeah. Uh, nope, don't mess with the system. Huh. They have to use the system to be able to, not just have proof, but to be able to create a, to be able to pull the DNA, to be able to say the DNA replication, or in forensic science, remember the three reasons, going back to your very first stage, what were the three reasons for doing DNA fingerprinting? Genetic testing. Are we genetic testing and forensics? No, maybe sometimes depending on the case, but what are we mainly looking for? The body identification. Identification. So each technique you learn about forensic DNA printing, it helps to identify individuals, suspects and suspect and victims. Why is this gel electrophoresis important? an important step in DNA forensics. What did that whole last process do? Give you a what? Cross. What is that called? DNA. Say a lot of A DNA fingerprint. So that whole process, that last process is very important because that's where we get our DNA fingerprint, our copy. Has DNA fingerprinting been a great help to the legal system? Yeah, you've seen the news. They've been, they've been able to identify people or suspects and things of that nature. All right, in your basket, you all have a note sheet. We're going to review. We're going to go through being able to identify maybe one of you or some unidentified person as a suspect in a crime that has been created committed. 
Go ahead in your basket and everyone get one of those seats. go through these small portions of notes. Most of it is reviewed before we get back down to the nature of identifying a suspect. So you are going to go You are going to be asked to rely on some information. I do not need anyone here to be silent because you all have this information. So if you do not have your notes out, you are going to need your science notes so that you can reflect back on what we just talked about, what we just learned with genetics and DNA. So, over here. So DNA stands for? Fill it in. Fill your box in, deoxyribonucleic <laughs> acid. Ribose means what? Yeah, you're going to need that real quick. Ribose means the what? Ends in OSC. Ribose must be the, the sugar. Nucleic, meaning that it is a what? DNA is a what? It is a nucleic acid. contains nucleotides, which are? Sugar, phosphate, and basic. Sugar, base, and phosphate. DNA under a microscope. So therefore, we can act, actually, I apologize, we can look under electron, a thick, a deep microscope, or we can see DNA not all the way down to sugar phosphate basement, but we can actually see DNA, but it's too small to actually see on a regular basis. So we want to add there, it's DNA is too small to see, but under a microscope, it looks like a twisted lab. Underline the word twisted up ladder, which is called a what? Double helix. Double helix. Add that right in this space here. Every living thing is made up of cells. That's what the picture there is telling you. Make sure you look up here so you know where you're putting it. You're not putting it in the wrong spot because this looks exactly like what you have. Going down even further, most plants and animal cells have a nucleus. And the nucleus tells us what to do. Underline tells us, tells the cell what to do. That's the job of the nucleus. Again, underline tells the cell what to do. Inside the cells are, what's this picture here? Inside the nucleus are, read the thing, it says inside the nucleus. Or you know that in the nucleus, that's in the cell. DNA. But in, those, in that DNA, you have these little extras, which are, same picture. Underneath the word chromosomes, I want you to write located in the, what are chromosomes located in where? In the DNA, so put that underneath there. Right here, inside the nucleus are chromosomes and parentheses located in the DNA. Chromosomes are made of long strands of tightly coiled DNA. 
if you stretch out the DNA, from a human cell, <clears throat> it's about six feet long. That's just in one cell, not all of your cells. Some living things have DNA or all living things? All living things. Every living thing has DNA. Every single little th living thing. That means that you have something in common with everything because they all have DNA and they all have the same four bases. Add that here. A lot of you did not interpret your graph correctly. Right here. All living things have the same four bases. Right here. A little bit more review with DNA. DNA is made up of steps, the rails and the ladder. This first arrow is pointing to the rails. What is that made of? Sugars and phosphates. That's your rail, and I want you to put next to the word rail, sugars and phosphates. I can give you all this picture. Oh, no, just to label your picture. You have to label your picture that looks just like this on our first one. I'm going to copy this one, but I guess that's fine. Let's have this picture. So your picture that you have on your first box, go ahead and label your rails, the rails, sugars, and phosphates. Always keep in mind the DNA is like a ladder. You have to hold on to the sides to get up the ladder. The sides that you're holding up is the rail, and that's going to be made of sugars and phosphates. Bonded to and uh, these middle portions is called the what? But it's called the what if it were a ladder? Steps. And that's made up of bases. So add the word steps and put bases. <coughs> Look at the picture. And they're underneath there, they're bonded together with hydrogen strong bonds. They weren't strong. We would be all over the place. Our DNA wouldn't stay together. So their base is bonded with hydrogen bonds. Just a review, no writing right now because this, you should have this already in another pair of your notes. The green is always going to go with, in this picture, the red. The yellow is always going to go with the purple. So if we put that into the actual bases, what are they? You don't have to know what the green is actually here, but you know about the bases. Lining goes with cytosine and lining goes with thymine. Very good. Any questions? That should be a very strong piece of information for you. All right, now down to your next box. DNA is made up of subunits, which scientists call nucleus. Come on, you should be adding that into your paper. You want your third box. What are your nucleotides made up of? Speak up. Sugar, phosphate, and bases. That's PD. And PS. PBS. Again, review. Four bases. What are they? Adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. I'm going to release all of these, but there's going to be a separate word next to it, and I want you to write that word down. So adenine is a purine base. This is just going to come in handy with the second one. Cytosine is a primidine base. Guanine is a purine, and thymine is a primidine. Obviously, because adenine is always going to go with 
timing, opposites attract. And why you gonna go with cytosine? So if we took out these words, we could say that a what would always go with a what? Because a purine will always bond with a pyrrole. Can I move from here? Okay, I'll give you a moment. Reflecting back on what you just wrote, the number of curing bases are going to equal the number of carnidine bases. And the number of adenine bases are going to equal the number of, use those words again. A goes with T, apples in the tree. Look at the board, Troy. The number of blank bases equals the number of cytosine bases. Why not? I'll review. I must have reviewed this so hard. We just had a benchmark. I hope you didn't get it. So the basic structure of DNA molecule is what's that structure called? Double helix, so it's a helical structure. Next to helical, I will put the words double helix so that you know that those words are interchangeable. Helical is that double helix. If you don't know what double helix is, what is this? Uh, Drika. Drika, what's double helix? So what is it though? So what does it look like? If somebody if you said, what kind of ladder? Twisted ladder. Put that down as well. Those words are interchangeable. Double helix, twisted ladder, helical, all mean the same. If you see them, they're all the same. You need to know all of those terminologies for it. And really quickly, DNA is made of subunits. What are these subunits called? What do scientists call them? Nucleotides. In this case, a nucleo nucleotide is a chemical compound contained of three portions. What are they again? Sugar, base, and phosphate, or sugar, phosphate, and base. All review, all good, all done with that, right? We're all strong with that. Yes? Yeah. All right. One last portion of review. So once again, DNA is made up, uh, uh, each nucleotide is made up of sugar base and phosphate, sugar, phosphate, and base. Who remembers what the gentleman's name was? This is not on your paper. But who remembers what the gentleman, the other gentleman's name besides Watson? Uh, was in 1953. Crick. Oh, okay. Crick. Oh, yes. Francis Crick. What was the lady's name who actually discovered it? Rosalind. Last name was Rosalind. 
she was the actual discoverer of it and she gave it to um, the Okay, so not on your paper. But DNA is like a fingerprint because everyone is different. So this is what we need to get in our mind. It's not an actual printing of your finger. That's not DNA. But it is a meaning because everyone's different. Everyone has their own copy. So how would the police look at DNA to figure out who committed a crime? That's what we're going to be talking about. And that's what we've been talking about. Just moving a little bit further to help us understand once again, once we get deep down into that DNA, we see our chromosomes, our chromosomes are raveled so tightly together, and when we look deeper into that, we see these double helixes, which are called DNA. On your notes, the backbone of DNA strand is made up of arterin phosphate and sugar residue. You have that information there. A genomic DNA is located in the cells what? DNA is located in every cell, well not every cell, but in human cells where? In the nucleus. Other eukaryotes, review back. What type of cells are eukaryotic cells? Multi or single? Multicellular. As well as small amounts, where else is DNA located? What other organelles? Organelles. The powerhouse of the cell, mitochondria, is also located in the other, another portion of a plant cell that is responsible for a big job as well. Prokaryotes, what type of cells are those? Prokaryotes. Single cellular. So give me an example of a single cell. Bacteria. Maybe down in the bottom of that box you might want to put a little star and put a note there. Prokaryotes, bacteria cells. Because a lot of you got that wrong. When you're asked about a prokaryotic cell, we colored it and labeled it. Jenny was really good at answering this several times before in prokaryotic DNA. It's held within an irregularly shaped body in the cytoplasm called a Good. Nucleoid region. Do we have enough information to be CSI investigators? You think so? All right. So you went through your schooling and your training. So a little bit of background information, you're not doing anything. Remember, you get your DNA from your, your parents, your mom and your dad. You have some dominance and some recessive type information that comes to you, which we'll talk about a little bit later. The dominant one is the one that's going to show up more. The recessive one is the one that either is going to be dormant or not show up as much. But you do inherit both and you pass those on to your children who pass them on to their children and their children and so on and so forth. So with that being said, not only can we use the DNA to, to uh, decide who the victim and the suspect is, we also use DNA to decide who what? Uh, the parents or the children. So if you have adopted children or children who are looking for their parents, what are they going to use to try to find the parents? DNA. The DNA. Same thing on Maury. What does he use to figure out who are not the father? DNA. DNA. So, always tell people apart by their DNA. And we use something called DNA profiling. Last slide on your, well not the last slide, but the last slide, you'll have to actually fill in that one blank. Our DNA has different sizes, and this comes from that whole, what process, the last process? What was the last process in your whole gel, gel electrophoresis? So our DNA has different sizes of pieces, so it makes a different pattern when we cut it up. What do we cut it up with? What are those things that, that cut it up? Say a lot of enzymes, and so uh, Kanar said as well. Enzymes, you're going to cut specific protein areas, so you might want to put cut up with enzymes underneath when you put cut it up. So here, we'll have suspect number one DNA sample. Looks very different from suspect number two because they have different sizes. So in DNA profiling, the lengths of variable sections of repetitive DNA, such as the short areas, 
are compared to the longer area, so it's compared between the two people. This is usually very reliable. This is why it's been so successful in crime analysis and also determining who the father or the mother or the child of uh, uh, uh. So it actually looks like this. This is what Greg would have done in the lab yesterday. Um, this is actual uh, visual of what it looks like. You have suspect one and suspect two. When we look at these two, which, if we look and we see that this pattern here is matched to this pattern, the first is matched to the second, and the third is matched um, to the fourth. That's how we're able to match them up together. Any questions with that? So when we look at that, what suspect DNA is matched with the question mark DNA? Warren. Put one finger up if you think one. Two fingers up if you think two. Good. So everyone should have suspect one. So DNA fingerprinting identification should be very simple for you. So now, before we do that, I want you to look at something. Look at your paper that you have before we move on. Who is the suspect? When you look at your on your paper, you have a blood stain, and then you have Bob, Sue, John, and Lisa. Talk it over with your table and decide. Who is the suspect that belongs to that blood stain? All right, so on your paper you have this. We have the blood stain that we found at the crime scene. And we have DNA fingerprinting. Who's the suspect? John. Johnny. You say John's the suspect? Yes. Matched it up. Everything matched perfectly. Yeah, All right. Now, a mom takes a former boyfriend. On Maury, <laughs> and they ask, Are you the father? No, Put your fist up if you say yes. Two fingers like this if you say no. This is yes in sign language. This is no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can I, this is yes. Oh. All right. So, Jenny, why do you say yes? This is the dad. Oh, I'm sorry, you were going to know. Why do you say no? The DNA doesn't match with the child. Why doesn't it? Tell me why. The pattern doesn't match? Yeah. Okay. Who said yes? Aaron, why? Why do you, what do you mean? So why is that, so why is that important? Okay, Aaron, what were you saying again? Why? No. Troy, be quiet. Okay, so you're telling me that the child inherits what from mom and what from dad? Inherits some genes from mom and some genes from dad. 20% from mom and 80% from dad? What? 50 50. 50%, 50%. 23 what? Chromosomes from mom and 23 chromosomes from dad. So it totals the amount of 46 chromosomes. So, unlike the suspects, when we're checking DNA, we are checking to see if the DNA actually matches. But when we're checking for parental, 
DNA. It's not going to be a match in pattern. We need to look at both the mom and the dad because the child is going to be a copy of both. So when we look here, we look at the first pattern and we say, with this pattern, so be quiet. We look at the child and we say, there's a match and there's a match. Then we look at the child and we say, okay, this matches only the mom and that's fine. Then we move down here with the child and we say, where is this? It's not with the mom, so we have to check and see if it's with the dad. It is, okay? Then we move down to our next pattern and we say it's not with the mom, but it is with the dad. So far so good? Moving here, I want to just put an arrow there. Look at the next pattern. This is not with the dad, but it is with the mom. We already know this is the mother, but even if we did it, if this was an adopted child, we can look and see who are these ch children's parents. Maybe this family moved on, started having had a life, they, they were younger, had a child, they gave it up for adoption, this child's not looking for their parents' parents. It finally comes out the system that this may be the parent. So then look at the next pattern of the child. There is no match with the mom, but it is a match with the dad. So therefore, is this daddy with the, the daddy? Yes, because what happens is you look and see each pattern. Where does it match? If it doesn't match the mom, then it must match the dad. If it doesn't match the dad, then it must match the mom. So that whole middle pattern has to be a match in either or, either or. So is this the daddy? Yes, is this the mom? Yes, because the child matches as a, as a combination of both patterns. All right? And now we're, yes, yes. Now we're ready to solve a mystery. So, here's the problem. Kim Kardashian was returning from a shopping trip armed still with bags when a person caught her by surprise and took her picture. Kim doesn't like to have uncandid pictures of her and the tabloids and filed a harassment suit with the police. She didn't see the person's face, but managed to grab hold of their arm for a second and scratch their skin. What did she just get a piece of? DNA. DNA. So here we have Kim Kardashian West, 35 years old. She's a high profile celebrity. We have some persons of interest. In your group, right now, you're going to look at your group and decide who's maybe the weirdest, who's the, who's the person who you would suspect would have done something like this. Let's look now. Once you've decided that person, that person is going to be the person whose DNA we are going to extract. All right, so decide who that person is in 30 seconds. All right, we have some persons of interest. There's an unknown person who's not in the system, so we don't know, which is why we've collected some DNA from some people that you've assumed may be the person, so we don't know if one of you are. But we also have Taylor Swift. Why would you think Taylor Swift would be a person of interest? We got Pete, all right. We also have Ray J. Yeah. <laughs> and then, obviously, we have to have the usual suspect, which is the husband. Yeah. It's always the suspect. All right, in your package, in your package, Troy, be quiet. We don't need to be inappropriate. In your package, you have some pieces of information. Pull your packet out for a second. You have some pieces of information. This here is your, actually, don't pull your packet out yet. I don't want to do it yet. This is your pieces of information for um, your DNA fingerprinting for eight suspects. We have four, one unknown and three that we know, and then we have four of you all that are here. In your package, you're going to have some information. You're going to have Kim, the victim. We need to collect her DNA because we need to know to rule her out, obviously, to know what DNA we're looking at. We don't want to 
run the DNA, and then in turn, we realized we don't have our person because when she scratched them, she could have also broken nail or got her own, we could have got her own skin scraping underneath her nails, correct? So we want to always make sure we have that to put that aside to know that's the DNA. You have Kanye, the reason why he's a suspect is because he's a husband, and the husband's always a prime suspect. Plus, he doesn't like anyone to take his chance, even his wife. Ray J. He was witness and seeing her in the kitchen nearby restaurant laughing. Couldn't have been the picture of that with him? Maybe. Taylor Swift, because she's a celebrity and they have bad blood. She would like nothing more for Kim to look bad in the tabloid so she can come up in her celebrity status. And then we have an unknown suspect who was seen lurking around her apartment before the picture snapping. So in your package, go ahead and pull these things out. You are going to... Take a moment really quickly, and you're going to see if you can match up. I gave, I gave two profiles of each person so that there's enough to go around, and I gave two of the samples as well. So on the side of each profile picture, there is the fingerprint, fingerprint of each suspect. You're going to see if you can match them up and identify which sample or fingerprint goes with which. One, two, three, four. Don't write anything on it, but just see if you can kind of put them in order. Which one is one, which one is two, three, four, which one is one, which one is four. All of that information. I'm going to take one minute to do that, and then we're going to clean up and we're going to come back to that. My suspects. Go ahead and take all of your tools and dump it in the trash. Who's Ray J? Ray J take print on that? No. Okay, I have to print another one. I have to print another one for Ray J. I didn't realize it's in print. So I'll have that tomorrow. Ray J. Alright, tomorrow, eyes up here. Tomorrow, our task will be to figure out whose fingerprint goes where, and then to figure out who actually committed this crime. Go ahead and take your um, evidence and put it back in your evidence envelope. Thank you.